primarily known for my work with Archie Comics. I've been at Archie now for 35 years. And I um, write and draw pretty much every character you've seen at this point. And I continue to um, write and draw for Archie. And um, then I also have a self-published series called Die Kitty Die, which I uh, kickstarted and that's now published um, through Chapter House and we've got another publisher coming up. And uh, I do a lot of conventions too. Um, and to my right is Philip K. Johnson, who um, we've known by, how long have we known each other? Five years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's doing some brilliant, brilliant work all over the place. So I'm going to let Philip talk a little bit about himself. Oh, thanks. So yeah, I'm Philip Kennedy Johnson. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, currently, I'm writing the ongoing series for Action Comics and Alien and Marvel. Um, I've written a Superman made title. Uh, the Last God, which mine was recently released as a, a collection. Um, at Boom Studios, I did a lot of stuff, stuff over there. Last Sons of America, uh, War Was Death, Lasha, et cetera. And um, yeah, I got, I think my first book was Last Sons of America about six years ago. In print, aside from some web comics I've been doing before that, and I was going to panels with Amy on right from the, from the jump. Amy was one of my first role models regarding her, her, her hustle and how much she was doing, like she was trying to and how savvy she was regarding you know, how to get into biz and, and, and stay relevant. So thanks so much for having me. So that's a whole other class on hustling. We're not going to cover as much of that today, um, but um, you know, uh, I think all of us are here all day, so you can you know come down and we will sort of give you the idea of like uh, aside from writing, what else you need to do to you know break in. Um, Let's see, how should we start first of all? How many of you also, no, let's try to make this a little interactive as well. How many of you are familiar with um, a comic script and what it actually looks like? Okay, okay, very good. This is even better than I expected, perfect. How many of you know who the script is for? Who reads the script? Anybody? Right, the artist. This is, oh, you have made our day. You know, this is great. Um, the script is not for um, the readers, right? What you're doing is making a blueprint for the artist and the art team, and then also maybe the editor, right? So that actually changes everything. Um, let's see. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and, I, and also there's like the two kind of scripts. There's the, the typed out script and there's the storyboard style script. Yeah, in fact, why don't you talk a little bit about your process, Dan? How do you go about writing? Well, my scripts are done um, storyboard style because I'm an artist, so I kind of think more in that sketched out way. Um, and when I receive a script, I mean, I'm fine with either way, when it's, if it's like typed out version or a storyboard. Um, the, the storyboard version gives you, I, I kind of prefer that a little bit. But um, yeah, as far as my process goes, um, I don't really know what, exactly how to describe it. I just, um, uh, like to, I, I got into writing a few years after I started working at Archie because, um, you know, when you're a, an artist, you're just kind of waiting on scripts and waiting for things, and then they started telling you, why don't you just start writing your own stories, and then you can draw them, and then, so you actually get a lot of uh, a lot of control, which is good. I'm like a good control freak, so it's really a good element to have when you can write and draw. So. Um, my process really, I was just telling you the other day, I have to write like when I first get up in the morning, like my mind is so foggy and messed up by the end of the day that um, usually I get up really early and I, um, that's when I do all my writing early. And then I can just draw and throughout the day and throughout the night because then if my mind is foggy, it doesn't, it might, might help me actually in the creative process there, but not when writing, so. What about you, Phil? How do you feel about? Um, I was really interested to hear about it. Interested to hear Dan's process. I um, he was talking about scripting, storyboard style. Because I like early on, I, I found a book that uh, offered different ways to, to put a script together, and one of them was storyboard style. And I, at some point, I talked to artists about it, and they they seemed offended at the very idea that I would like storyboard stuff for them to draw. But coming from Dan, that would make total sense. Like if, if coming from another artist who's also a writer, that uh, I know it was really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes total sense from your perspective. As a, as I'm not a capable uh, artist, I would, I would not be giving them storyboards. Um, yeah, I wanted to 
kind of jump into what Amy said about uh, it's, it's for the artists, obviously, and not for the readers. I, um, so when I jumped onto Superman and Action Comics, uh, Brian Michael Bendis had just left the title, or was, was in the program, we were like handing it off. And uh, I read one of his scripts, um, which was rife with typos, which I thought was hilarious because he was one of my, my favorite writers. Uh, but he, um, it was a really well done story, and he, it, it, in there it said, um, he was right. He was telling the artist a story so that they can then tell a story, and I like that a lot. And I try to remember that in my own writing. Um, so I, I don't. I'm trying. I try not to be too precious with the with the, the panel descriptions and everything. It's, it's all about how to communicate with them. And when, before I work with an artist, I try. I ask them what, um, how they like to work. Like how if they, how much direction they prefer. Because some people will will prefer a lot of direction. They want everything laid out. Just like just tell me what to do put everything on the page, and I'll, I'll get it done. And other people want a lot more control, and um, would prefer, does anyone know what Marvel style script means? So it's, um, it's funny, because Marvel does not typically do things that way anymore, but it, it refers to plot style script, where instead of panel one, full description, dialogue, panel two, full description, dialogue, instead of all that, like very meticulous, it's more, um, almost like paragraph form is where it is. Like you kind of describe what's on the page, and then the artist will express it, and then you add the dialogue at the end. I usually don't like to work that way, because I, I find that a lot of details kind of come out on wash, but I, um, but I do make sure that the artist has a lot, of, uh, a lot of feedback, a lot of control, so that basically I'll write out everything in detail with the understanding that they are free to basically change whatever. We're, we're, we're free to discuss anything. So, so if I do something stupid, um, you know, not thinking about the, the art as, as much as I should, they can, you know, we can, you know, well, here's actually something that will work a lot better, and invariably it will, it will improve if we're able to talk through stuff like that. So I'll, I'll write a lot of detail on my scripts with the understanding that I want them to collaborate with me. I, I, need, I need the process to be collaborative above all. So that's, that's how I usually how I approach it. So I put up a few slides for you guys, um, just to make it look more official. Um, also, um, I do teach writing at the Kubert School, the art school, so I feel like, you know, this is like a legit academic exercise for which you get for free, and those students pay, you don't want to know how much they pay. Um, uh, as Philip was saying, first of all, for all of you, if you, if you don't know already, comics is a collaboration. Unless you are also drawing your own story, Think about it as teamwork. Uh, very few artists, and if any of you already uh, work in a team environment, I think as most of you do, you know the worst thing to do and the worst demotivating thing to do is just kind of do the top down, you know, like my way or the highway, right? That is very demotivating, especially when you want to get the best out of the people you're working with. And I want to also talk a little bit about, I want to go back here, when we're talking about artists, important to know how to actually make the comic. The process is actually, and for a lot of us, we work on mainstream comics primarily, but even indie comics, you're really oftentimes dealing with multiple people, including a colorist and a letterer. So when you're composing your script, remember, you're, it's a set of instructions for everybody. So you need to also call out certain things. When the letterer needs to know something, put a little note, letterer note, Okay, sound effects, right? Here's sound effects um, thinking about, and I frequently couch it in kind of like this, but if I'm working with, uh, as, as we frequently are, we're working with very experienced people. I will say, well, this is what I'm thinking, but if you have a better idea, you know, go for it. Especially for colorists. I just, so, um, not to call out anybody, but you know, like I said, I teach a lot of writing classes um, at the Kubert School, so I look at a lot of beginning scripts. And a lot of times the writer will say something like, um, so when, uh, to the colorist, should be a gradation of blue, and here's the Pantone color, you know, and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, are you the colorist? You know, I, I, it's okay to just tell the colorist, establish mood. We want it just to be a moody twilight. I'm thinking blue. You know, you don't need to say cerulean blue or anything like that, okay? Um, and you also don't need to go into paragraphs. People just want to know how do we establish the mood, how do we establish, and maybe throw out some colors, but you don't need to get that specific, okay? Um, let's see. Um, we talked briefly about full script versus Marvel method. Um, oh, 
a very important question for the people here. Is your interest really to write, like, to be up here and to write for Marvel in DC? How many of you are sort of thinking that or possibly thinking that? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, okay. Um, so for the rest of you who are thinking, I just want to make my own comics, indie comics, yeah? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, so we won't spend too much time on this whole full script versus Marvel method then, because if, if for the ones who want to be up here, you really have to do full script. And the full script means all the detail, not the sort of paragraph, paragraph. I like, okay, so for the, for the people here who are thinking more, you know, you're doing your own thing, and maybe working with some of your friends, you, don't have, you, can, you can do it more collaborative. You don't have to spell it out as we do, as I'm supposed to be doing today, because I have a full script due tomorrow. Um, yeah, which, you know, no problem, right? I'll just sit there and I'll just hammer it out. Um, don't do what we do, okay? You see me in my booth, don't talk to me today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but if, if, to your, for your benefit, though, I'm happy to show you what I'm working on, okay? Um, and there's also a sort of mentality when we're sort of work for hire, we got to get stuff in on time. Uh, and I'm actually working on a creator own thing as well, but those have deadlines. Deadlines are very important, you know? Um, I, I'm going to go through a little bit about uh, actually my process. Because we're going to run out of time, right? We've got three people here. Um, you got to keep me also honest in terms of uh, where we are because I want to get in a few questions as well. Um, but my process has evolved a little. I started off doing what I thought was Marvel method. Um, and also a little bit about my background. So this is also, I think, kind of important because depending on where you're coming from, your comfort zone, especially if you're a prose writer, you're gonna to wanna to rely on your words. You think your words are gonna carry through everything. Comics writing is different. The number one thing to remember is it is a visual style of writing. You're dealing with, um, you, uh, it is, there is a strategy to the writing. You have, you, th you have to think in terms of real estate, okay? You're thinking in terms of, is this eight pages? Is this 16 pages? Is this 20 pages or maybe even 180 pages? It's not prose where you just keep going, 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 because uh, I think most of us will talk specific, I, I, my default is to talk specifically more about um, print comics. Um, we will also talk a little bit about digital, which is a little different, but it's still the same. Digital, you have specific real estate. You have this uh, Kindle format, webtoon. Is anyone doing any web comics? Digital comics? Yeah? Okay. So. These, you, ha you have to know what you're writing for. If you're writing for a digital comic, know is it going to be a webtoon style topless? How, how does the reader go through? Now, if we are talking about print comics, and it, you all have read print comics, presumably, what is it? You're turning the page. You're turning the page. You're not doing a screen swipe. That changes how you um, experience the story. So knowing that, that informs how you're gonna write. Not the paragraphs of, um, what's a newbie mistake, you guys? What, is, what would be a newbie mistake for a script? I mean, overwriting, for sure. Overwriting, overwriting, also, the character is thinking these things. That's not a visual thing, that's getting inside someone's head, right? Yeah. We have to write for the reader in a visual way. So this idea of someone, first of all, blinking, you can't blink. What we're doing is static images, and the blinking is implied, the thinking is implied, but what you're doing is writing, think of it as a silent movie. You gotta go Charlie Chaplin. Does anyone still remember Charlie Chaplin? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, right, okay, so um, that's the number one thing when you're going through your script, is real estate, visual, and remember, really, essentially one action per panel. That's why you can't open, close the door, cross the room, sit down, blink, have breakfast. That's like yeah. already like two pages. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Like, it's I'm not as as great as I would like to be as far as visualizing uh, panel layouts. And I honestly, I don't even try anymore because I, I don't want to micromanage my artists, and they always, 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 always do better than me. And putting together a, a well constructed page, so I don't I don't bother in try to trying to visualize each specific panel, unless there's something super obvious like um, you know the door uh, whatever um, go in and somebody's 
tied up lying on the floor. It was clearly a very horizontal kind of image. You can't have a panel that's like super vertical if the if the visual that they're seeing is something that's clearly horizontal, a, a wide shot, or if it's um, you know like the, I'm thinking like the Frank Miller Dark Knight Returns thing where um, Bruce is falling down into the cave. You know, there's a series of very very vertical kind of panels. Some some things like that are very obvious, but um, otherwise I just kind of think in terms of don't overcrowd the, the page with too many panels. Um, the, the, the key, though, is to to visualize the page in static images. That's what that's what Amy was talking about. Like you can't. You know, there was a, a an example in some book I read about Captain America bursts through the window and throws a shield and disarms you know whoever. Um, that is probably too much for one image. Like you need to see what is happening in this image. You say you know you can show Cap. Busting through the window, that's one, okay? But if he's, you know, if he's in the room already and throwing a shield and the other dude's already disarmed and on the floor, just think about what, you know, what is that image going to look like? Think of it in terms of static images, otherwise it's not going to work. That's a huge new mistake. Dan, you have some newbie. Well, when you, when you mentioned the overriding thing, the other way you can override is just too much dialogue. Because you can have, you know, like a, a, a panel with three people in it and each person is saying so much stuff that there's no word for, room for an illustration anymore. Yeah, and then it drives the letter I mean. crazy too, because the letter has to like to do all that work. Yeah, that's what I meant, that I just not have a crowd there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so here's the other thing, is remember, the dialogue, the lettering, if, if, if any of you graphic designers, yet, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. That is a visual element. Now, you can use that to, to your advantage, because now that's a visual element, it helps track the eye. So you can use those word balloons to help you out. But if you're thinking like a prose writer, and if you read some comics, you know who the prose writers are because there's massive blocks of text, okay? That's not helping the story. And anytime you remember that, it takes the reader out of the story. Last thing you want to do is take the reader out of the story. So those graphic elements, those words, have to appear on the page in order for us to read. But if you're doing your job well, the magic occurs when you don't even remember that balloon is there. You're literally reading it in conjunction with the image. So always remember, when you're doing, when you're sort of orchestrating your page, what you're doing is essentially graphic design in your head. And I am very fortunate, I'm not a prose writer, but I studied architecture. So I think visually already, and that really helped me tremendously. I don't consider myself a writer, in fact. Um, I think of myself really as a storyteller. And what you're doing is you're taking a page, breaking it down like Philip said, don't do too many panels. In fact, rule of thumb, I think I have a slide here somewhere. Uh, I try to keep to five to seven, uh, I don't have that slide here. Anyway, uh, I'll figure out a way to get you guys uh, some of these slides and don't tell the Cupid School. But um, uh, five to seven panels is kind of a good place for you to be, especially if, not, if you've not done this before. I err on the side of minimalism. I tend to go three to five. But it largely depends on what's going on on the page. Every panel has to tell part of the story. It should, nothing should be wasted. It's not, it, we're, what we're talking about is the economy and minimalism of telling a story, because that's all you've got. You don't got motion. You don't have sound. You have to imply all that. The, the magic, though, is that the stuff that happens in between the panel that's why readers get into comics, because you have imagination. You fill in the blanks, and that's where the skill comes in, in terms of what we do as writers. And I know you're thinking, well, isn't all that the artist's you know, job? No, that's us. We, as the writers, are the ones that say, essentially, first page, splash, which is the full one panel, big little you know, uh, picture. We don't draw it, but we need to give that blueprint to the artist. The artist may say, oh, well, actually, what about if I do an inset panel here, too? Absolutely, but they need to start from somewhere. So that is our job. I feel like if I'm not doing that, if I do page three to five action sequence, that I'm not doing my job. Unless the artist says, hey, I, I would prefer to do that, fine. But, you know, I'm paid to basically provide a full script. I will break it down. Um, part of what we also do is, um, it, in, it, is, it comes with practice, is understanding how much space it takes to do something, to tell part of the story. Action requires a different amount of space than maybe a quiet moment, which may be just one beat, one panel. 
So that will also come with practice, right? I mean, um, and again, this is kind of the newbie thing is, if you're reading a, fir uh, a, a first time comic, you'll, the pacing may be off. You'll, and when, you're, when you're writing, maybe you're feeling that too. It's like, I can't get a sense of the timing. We control the time. And more often than not, you'll find that the story gets rushed at the end. And we've all seen movies and TV shows like that, where you're like, well, what's going on? Suddenly they're wrapping up all that stuff. You will find yourself, unless you're incredibly gifted, also in that position. So your job is to smooth that out, okay? Um, and this is what I spend most of the time with my students saying, don't rush into it, don't just sit down and just kind of vomit out the words. Work out your structure first, and then start filling in your story. So that is, that is my, what I've just told you is basically my approach. I always work on the ending first, beginning, ending, and then working out the middle. That's what I do. Um, so for me, okay, that's an interesting approach. I, uh, I like your warm method actually offline. <laughs> yeah, he's like, that's a messed oh, up approach. <laughs> no, that's not what I said at all. Uh, no, I actually start from, um, so for, I mean, if we're going from the very like the real beginning, like for, we'll, we'll, I'll take a, a very basic paragraph form kind of idea of what happens in the story, and then turn it into something a little, a little prettier, something like it's more concise. I'll take a, the concise outline and turn it into page breakdowns, which is a, a version of in which you see like on one page what things happen. And the reason I started doing that is because. I tend to overstuff my scripts, and so I want to make sure that I can realistically fit everything into one issue. So it's like page one, you see, blah. Uh, pages two and three is when this happens. Pages four, five, six, and seven are this, this you know, action chasing thing or whatever. And I, I can kind of, I've been doing enough of these that I can actually tell roughly how long a scene or a, 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 you know, some kind of an event is going to take on the page. And I'll you know, break it down into like mom's bullet points. And then I'll cut and paste those bullet points into an empty comic template that I have. And that kind of helps me avoid what Amy was talking about where you tend to over, like rush towards the end or over stuff. I am, if I, I'm a meticulous outliner to avoid that. And I know not all writers like to use outlines, but for, com for reasons, for, for comics specifically, I would encourage you to use an outline. You don't have to stick to it, but you should start from, from an outline in my opinion. If you, I know some people do like, like to just start and write till the end, um, or you know, break up in different sections. But I, I find that if you outline, you can kind of avoid the pitfall that I've fallen into over and over and over again, where you've got you know 28 pages of story for a 22 page script. Um, so I encourage you to outline, and that that'll help you keep the pace, you know, as as it should be, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I do something similar, and again, outlining is. A, you know, I try to break it down. If I know it's a 20 page issue, which is standard for um, monthly comics, I literally just number one, two, three, four to 20. And then I'll start breaking it down, okay? You know, beginning, the beginning and the end. And the reason I focus on the end is, and I find this frequently for a lot of people, if you haven't figured out the ending, where are you gonna go, you know? Um, I don't feel like I have a story unless I know how it ends and it can change. That's the important part. When you're doing the outline, as Philip was saying, stuff will change because you'll start getting, you'll start understanding your story, more importantly, your characters better. And at a certain point, your characters, you know, that ending doesn't actually fit what the characters will actually do. You gotta keep consistent. You gotta keep the logic flow. Um, Dan, how do you go about that? Well, speaking of the end, I, I always have the ending. I always have the ending first. Because a lot of the stories I write are like, five and six page stories, that's the format of Archie. So you, you have to have that like ending that's kind of like a joke too. So that's the most important part. So that part gets, is, is done first. And then, um, and then the rest follows. And if it's like a 20 page story, like it's a full length book, like you guys do, I sort of have to like, figure, I kind of map out what I do every like five pages. Because also sometimes we do like five page chapters. Mm -hmm. um, but the, even in an adventure kind of story, the, uh, the, I'll work, I have to know the end first. It's just and then when I'm writing like a synopsis, like we, I'll give the editor synopsis for different stories. Um, and the synopsis basically, in each synopsis, the ending is, is is more prominent than the actual like details of the story. So we, we that's that's definitely a, a a more prominent thing with Archie stories. So the analogy I tend to use is, um, you know, again the architectural analogy. It's like you are 
moving into a one bedroom or a studio. That's not the time to get the baby grand piano and all that stuff and try to figure out how to fit all that in. You gotta chuck the piano. If you're really dead set on having that piano, then you got to like organize your um, other stuff around that. Um, so so if frequently a lot of, and I'm sure you all have an idea or hopefully multiple ideas. Some ideas are just simply not suitable as you know, you'll find out when you get the invitation or maybe you say, oh, I wanna be part of this anthology and it's five or six pages or it's 10 pages. If you're doing something, especially action, you've already eaten up like three to four pages on action. How do you do character development in that period of time? So always look for what is going to fit the amount of real estate you have. And if it's not gonna fit, don't try to shoehorn it in by doing you know, 10 panels, 10 panels, and maybe it'll make it work. That's wishful thinking, right? One of, the, one of the things that I do regarding form, you know, when we're first getting into like the, you know, laying the skeleton place for the, for the issue, is uh, once we've done what we're discussing here, and um, you know, kind of divided up what the, what the big sections are, where the, you know, where the piano goes, where everything else goes around it, um, the, I will kind of, unless it's a very unusual scene, most of the scenes will fit into the category of either dialogue driven or visual driven. And I mean, I'm, okay, I mean, comics visual driven entirely, or should be, but it, but just from a starting place, like this is a scene in which this, the, uh, the monologue or the conversation really, really matters. I will kind of let's say that's in that's in red, say in your in your script, and then the other sections where it's an action scene or you know the, the horror scene or whatever, it's very visual driven. That's a that's a blue scene. Okay, so for the red scenes, I will go through and not think about uh, real estate at all, meaning like how many, how many pages I have, I'll just write the conversations if I'm writing a short story, a prose story. I'll just write the conversation and make sure that that part really sings. Um, and then when I do the, the blue scenes, the action scenes, or the, the visual driven scenes, I'll write those without thinking about the dialogue too much, and I'll just make sure what are the important things we wanna see on the page. Um, and then, of course, you want to go through both of those and make the red more blue and the blue more red. And you, you kind of add the words that make the, the visual scene, you know, stronger. And then you keep, you add the visuals that make the, uh, the dialogue driven scenes more compelling. And not, it's just not just talking heads the whole time. And you kind of homogenize the whole thing and make it all, all visual driven, but also, you know, try to make every word count. Um, I find that's a, a much more concise and, um, streamlined way to, to approach it. I try to start, I mean, in the end, it should all be very visual and every word should matter, but uh, it's just a way to kind of get started on each scene for me. A useful rule of thumb for your dialogue, 15 to 20 words per balloon, okay? Use it as a template. I don't mean to say lay down the law, but that will help you because when you're going above, you know that you're, you know, you're, you're kind of doing an info dump perhaps. Um, try to keep it to that size. Um, I tend to underwrite. Um, and I find um, in the letter class, by the way, you're gonna go through multiple drafts. I have to beef, beef up my dialogue because I tend to use it as a placeholder. That's awesome. <laughs> right, I, 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 I'm like weird, right? Um, you're, you're, um, also because, like I said, I, I did not start off as a writer. I find the whole thing very kind of interesting. Um, so I, I it, of course words matter, but it's the whole construction of what you're doing is what really matters. You're responsible for the user experience, okay? And what you're also doing, and I'm, I'm gonna, uh, is this useful? Is this something that you guys, okay. Um, is while we're talking about this, and this is also very important, right? Because we're laying down the foundation, we're putting up the beams, we're doing all these things, is don't forget that it, it's all about the characters. If you have like a, 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 a wonderful plot down, but we, we don't care about your characters, what's the point? Okay, and it, just like you're all watching shows or doing whatever and cool, cool special effects, but we're not invested in the characters. That's the real trick. Okay, so that fundamentally, you always gotta get back to who are my characters? You know, and why do we care about these characters? And that I find sometimes the hardest part in the end, because especially for these little anthologies and things, you wanna do the cool ending, the Twilight Zone ending and things like that. But if we actually didn't really care about the character and the surprise ending, where are we? 
right? That's, that's the major failure for us as writers. And the artists also pay, play a role in this, right? Because they're designing the character as well. If it, if, you know, if, unless it's already existing IP work or already invested. I just did a Jughead uh, horror story, by the way, that'll be coming out in November. They just announced it yesterday, so I can talk about that. But we already, for the most part, know who Jughead is. So that part is taken care of. If you guys are writing your stories, you have the additional burden of why do we care? Who are these characters, right? So you need to also think through that layer that's super important. What am I missing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the character versus plot thing is super important. I have no, yet another mistake I've made in which I, 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 uh, I tend to think in terms of world building and blow to world build. And sometimes I get so caught up and it's like, I have this really awesome high concept idea. Uh, but it kind of, it becomes sometimes this big plotting Old Testament thing that doesn't have any characters that you really want to dig into, and it has to be character driven. Like the character driven stories are the ones that matter, and you have to, to show us who the characters are through like just detail, like a little detail about who they are, about their appearance, about what they do, about their the, the way they speak, and uh, just make them feel real to us. You know, that's yeah. Your story should also must always be. I'm not saying you can't world build and, and have these huge, awesome, high concept ideas. But it should be built around characters, and you have to show us why these people matter and get us invested in their lives and what's happening with them. So yeah, character first always. Let me talk a little bit about um, Larry Hama, who I consider a mentor. He really helped me as I was getting started. Larry has written what I mean, 250 um, issues of uh, GI Joe. He's done Wolverine. He's done just about everything. And when you ask him what his process is, he just said, oh, "I just sit down and I just let it roll out like a carpet." Oh my God. Um, but again, I think that's different because he's been writing for decades and he's already got the idea. He lets the characters drive the story. He already knows these characters and he knows where they're going to go, kind of. Um, so I think it's a little different. But you see, he's very character centric. He's like, you know, what would Baroness do? What would, you know, it's kind of like that's sort of his thing. Um, and, um, and that's why I also think, think about your genre. If you are writing that, murder mystery, you gotta have the ending, right? Um, so I think that's also very specific to how you approach that process. I like to write mystery, my first book, Poison Ivy, that was a really a murder mystery. That's why I had to work out the whole outline and figure out who done it, you know, who dies, who done it. That's a little bit different than if I'm writing something else, right? Maybe um, um, the, you know, a adventure game, for example, or where we're going. You know, there's some more exploratory things, but when you're doing murder mystery, you have to leave enough clues, and that takes a lot of construction and thinking. We are going to run out of time, so I want to start answering some questions. Okay, um, you at the end. Yeah, I guess you mentioned it a little bit, but like when you're doing outlining, and back when you, once you get to the script process, how much freedom do you give yourself to kind of like beg to walk the outline if in the middle of the script you're like, I don't think this character would really do this, or I don't know if this really works? I guess what do you do at that point? No, I mean, you should let, you should, you should let that. It, this is all malleable. You should allow yourself that, you know, if, if it's not working, it's not working. If something does not fit, I don't want to say kill it, but move it aside. Because sometimes it's your favorite scene that's holding things up, and it doesn't make sense anymore now that we understand the characters. Remember, you're going to do multiple drafts. The most important thing, though, is to remember, finish your script, okay? Don't just say, okay, because I have this outline, I'm just going to plow through, but it's no longer making sense. Give yourself some leeway to say, okay, let me re rework it, okay? Um, but in the end, don't use that as an excuse to say, okay, now I'm stuck, writer's block, I'm going to quit, and I'm not going to get to it. I hope that's helpful. Uh, yes, you in the back. Okay, um, I was wondering, how do you guys personally deal with uh, burnout, either like character burnout or writing burnout, or just like overall burnout? Because I know how you guys deal with this as this being your job, and how do you continue to move forward? Well, you have to really like doing it. <laughs> if you don't love it, you're going to burn out even more. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, you know, you have, it's tough because there are deadlines you have to meet, and um, you know, a good motivator is, you know, you need to get paid. <laughs> it's a great motivator to uh, get, just get working, get cracking. <laughs> um, but burnout's natural, too. You have to, like, let yourself uh, rest, too, and take care of yourself, too. I mean, you have to, like, kind of balance it. It's a balance. 
for me, I would encourage you to kind of remind yourself why you love it. And you do that by finding people whose work you admire very much. And I mean, that's, that's what I do. Like when I, I mean, it's a, I've got kind of two careers going and I, uh, I just don't sleep anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, you know, it's energy drinks. Coffee. <laughs> I, uh, I try to find stuff that I really admire. Uh, I, some, some, the other night somebody was asking about, uh, on those panel, about what uh, some words and books like change the game for you. And some of those that I go back to perennially are, well some of these are kind of newish actually, but, uh, but Day Tripper is one that, that really showed me what could be done. So I, I didn't read comics for years. Like I, I loved them as a kid all the way through like early days of college. And then I just went all in on my, on my career at the time and um, didn't read comics until maybe about 10 years ago and I got back into the scene and was just blown away by how far we had come and what people were doing now, what was possible. And there was amazing stuff before that too, but it wasn't stuff I was seeing. I, I didn't, you know, I was in the middle of darkest Kentucky with no, with no uh, comic stores around. I had no idea about Preacher or like, you know, Crumb or anything. It was all just like Marvel DC is what comics were. Um, so, but now, and then I was just, my mind was just blown open with all these amazing things. So now I go back to things like, my favorite thing is Monsters, Day Tripper, um, oh my god, the, uh, the new-ish translation of Beowulf by Garcia and Rabin, and, um, uh, god, so many, I'm sorry, I'm right now, there's so many things that matter to me and think deeply, uh, the Hellboy series. Um, I just, I try to find these things and, um, just remind myself of what can be, What's, what's possible and why I love them and remind myself, I, you know, this is what I want to do with my life. It's the things that I want to make. I want to make things that last. Um, that's what kind of re-energizes me. Yeah, I think you got to figure out your motivation. Um, in a lot of ways, it's also, um, the reason I write so many really different things is the challenge. Can I write this particular genre? Can I write this character? Some characters are more difficult than others. And I'm, I'm talking licensed characters, right? Um, so that motivates me. It's like, can I write a good Kiss comic? You know, how can I? Can I? Um, uh, I have certain things like I, I feel like I need to work on my dialogue. I need to work on when you're doing ensemble, like you're doing team book. Betty and Veronica meets um, what do they meet? Vampirella Red Sonia, right? That I did that because I'm like, that's a challenge. Why are they even in the same room? That's ridiculous, right? Can I make a good story out of it and make sure each character still has agency? That's a challenge. That's what keeps me motivated. At a certain point, sometimes you're like, I can't do this, you know? Um, but the, it is the biggest thrill to actually pull, you know, be able to do it and have people say, you actually made it work. So the second part of that question, though, is also figure out your support systems, you know? It could be your family. Uh, generally speaking, it's not great. Your, your parents will always either say, actually my parents don't even read my comics, but you know, find, you know, find people who are not just saying, oh, that's really great, but find your tribe of people who are going to help you out, you know, give you critical feedback that you respect. People will help you out if you have kids. Like, you know, I basically did all this, you know, with kids crawling all over me. You gotta figure out who, how, how can you do all these things, you know, and juggle all this stuff. Um, and make it work. And it's very easy to burn out if you don't have that, you know. Um, I'm lucky that my mom lives nearby, so sometimes I gotta dump the kids off because I got a deadline. That helps a lot, you know. So work all that stuff out. Um, you know, caffeine helps a great deal, you know. Um, yeah, that's it, okay. Now you have a question. Yeah, um, speaking of support, as for editors, uh, working with editors, how is that you go about asking your editor for support and what makes a good editor for you? Uh, for the, in the back, the question was how to, um, the, what makes a good editor, basically. Um, I would say, so whenever I get a, a note from an editor, like, this is something that's not working yet, or this is something that we need to address, this is something, this is something we need to get, we're not getting to the place we need to get these characters yet, those kinds of notes are almost always right. But when they try to tell us, do this instead, 
um, those notes are typically raw. <laughs> like I, I use, I don't like when a when a vendor says, uh, here's you know, what if they said something like this instead, or what if? I mean, sometimes you know, now and I do sometimes take those ideas, those suggestions, but very often they're like, I feel like we can do better than this. Um, but whenever there's, whenever they say something like, I'm not, I don't feel like this is earned yet, like that kind of thing, those notes are almost always great. Um, so basically, that's kind of those are the best notes for, for me from a good editor. Like they're they're here to kind of be a sounding board and to help us get what we're trying to get it to, but not but not be our puppet master where they're trying to write through us. You know, that's that's the worst. Get micromanaged is the, is the worst. Yeah, good editors should have, um, and it, depending on where we're talking books versus comics, sometimes, but. A good editor needs to have a lot of skills, but it's the people skills too. It's like how do they're supposed to get the best out of their creative team? And frequently, like again, that's the best is not saying do it my way, but also, um, and this is true for animation and TV writing is the story rules over everything. We're trying to make the best story possible. How do we get there? And um, I, I, my kids are actually great because they. A lot of editors sometimes uh, it's a personal opinion or whatever, but I have kids who like if they don't get the story, I know there's a problem because they're not going to lie about it. My mom reads a story, which she doesn't. You know, she's going to say, "Oh, that's really good. That doesn't help." But my kids are like, "Yeah, I didn't really understand what happened." That's a very important note. Okay, so that's you know part of it. It's a whole other thing talking about editors, but. Um, you know, it's not just about liking your editor, it's having the, uh, the respect, mutual respect, really, um, and that you trust their skills. Um, I, we're running out of time, let's try to get two more questions in, it's you there. Um, so you said that you usually come up with the ending and then you figure out the beginning. How, what are some things that help you fill in the in-between? <laughs> Um, it, it is that, right? You're, you're figuring out a goal, it's the path. Think of it as a path and how do, what's the best way to get there. So that in between, it, that's where you start getting depressed and, you know, you know, and at a certain point you're like, why am I even doing this? That's the challenge, okay? But it is that journey that makes it great for everybody. As I'm writing it, I know what the challenge is, you know, that's it. Uh, we are out of time, but let's do this. Um, where are you, where are you sitting? You are all sitting together. Um, I am in Artist Alley, at table D01, and you can find me and uh, stop by and ask questions. And, yeah. I'm at A05, that means I'm the best writer, fifth best writer in the room, I think, I guess how that works. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm A05, yeah. so come see me. I am actually right behind Dan, so that makes it really easy. And since, you know, we're all working on deadlines, you know, you can ask her questions and give us a reason to procrastinate, and, um, right? So, um, thanks so much, I'm sorry, we, we really didn't have enough time, this is really a two hour kind of session, but, um, so some resources, first of all, follow us all on the social media, you know? Uh, come down to my table, I'll give you all that, because I frequently will put out stuff, or sometimes we start downloading things that we gripe about, you know, with a script or something. Um, and what else, what else? I don't know, yeah, I mean, come to my booth if you have any more questions. I'll have to talk to you more about any of this stuff. I know it's, I know it's an uh, intimidating process to, to get started on, so I, I love teaching and talking about these things, so please come and come see yourself. The, 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 the most important thing is finish your script, okay? Finish yeah. your script. If you finish your script, you'll start another one. But don't noodle on your script forever and ever. Get it done. You can always go back and revisit. Exactly. That's embrace, a little thing. Embrace the crappy first draft. You can always revise something that's not good. You can't revise nothing. So finish it up. Thank you for coming.